how to build a multi seven figure income while you're still working part time. In today's episode, we're going to talk about what it looks like to partner with God in inside of tragedy to cling on to him in even our worst situations that turn into some of the best situations in our life. We're going to talk about how you can build a seven multi seven figure income and how this person did even while he's working full time inside of the military as a pilot and how you can together grow your spousal relationship as a believer and be the influencer inside of your home. Welcome to God's Business, where I interview the top Christian thought leaders, influencers, and entrepreneurs, where you can build not just a good business, but God's business, where he is the multiplier of your success inside of your life. Today, I had the honor of sitting down with a great friend of mine who is a pilot in, uh, inside the military and was working a full-time job when he discovered real estate real estate education and leverage those two things to build a multi seven figure income while he was still working part uh, full time. And also on top of that, that he felt like God led him down that path because something that happened with his child that you're going to hear about here that allowed him to leverage his finances to invest in his family's future. And inside of that also encounter God in the midst of all of that. Welcome, my good friend. Bill, what's up, man? We're not on an airplane right now, which is a little bit like anticlimactic. If anyone hasn't checked out this guy's content on Instagram, you can see crazy pilot. And thank you for your service as well with what you've done. But welcome to the God's Business Podcast. I'm happy to be here. And uh, next time we do one of these, you'll be in the airplane with me and I'll be interviewing you. Let's go. This is going to be amazing. It, I, I know it's like I wish I was giving you quite the same experience, but we get to talk about some really cool topics that maybe aren't normal. For every other business podcast, I, th I think this is a really big deal to not really have compromise. Uh, faith is a really big deal inside of my life, and as well as yours, as well as business. And you know, it's great to talk about faith. Yet the majority of our time of our day is serving customers and learning about marketing strategies, selling and numbers and mar like markets. And then on the opposite side as well, though, you have this this place of wanting to be sharpened in our faith and a greater purpose than just. You know, we're just here to exchange goods and services for money. And so it was just so cool. We, we got to really meet each other at one of Russell Brunson's events and hang out there and hearing your story. And then I've just heard great things as well from uh, our mutual friends, Brandon, Kalen Poulin, who I just got off a phone call with. And they just said such great things. And some of those interviews, they jumped in an airplane randomly, your airplane, to fly from a really far flight from Florida all the way to San Diego. I think you guys made it. Did your plane go there with no fuel stops just all the way there? Uh, we, no, we had to stop in Texas. And speaking of faith, it has to take a lot of faith for to jump in somebody's airplane that you ha just met that weekend and uh, was a recommendation from somebody else saying that he's a good guy and a great pilot. So um, that takes that takes a lot. So, yeah, it was great meeting them and spending time with you as well. So it's it's been really cool. I it's kind of a new world for me kind of getting involved in Russell's world and some of the folks that were there from the very beginning, like you guys. So it's been really cool to uh, spend some time and get to get to know all of you guys. So when I first, I first talked to a pilot, he once talked about that when the, like the wind is crazy, you can sometimes come in, they practice these landings where they're just like completely sideways, like just craziness. And this guy had a small, let me be eight seater plane or something. And he's from Australia and he would always talk to me about it. And he just raved about it. What's one of the craziest experiences flight experiences that you've had either like you know near death i don't know if that's like a juju you can't talk about it or just like wild stuff that people would never expect that you can do in an airplane that you've like lived what's the craziest ones yeah so i have two that come to mind so one is like a really fun story so that'll be good for everybody listening so um i had a bonanza a36 it's a six seat single engine piston plane uh, kind of small plane and um I flew up to a mastermind meeting of mine in Boston. So I was flying from Nashville to Boston. I had some friends fly into Nashville to fly with me. And we flew up the Hudson River in New York City at 1,000 feet. So I was flying like under the buildings, right next to the Statue of Liberty. Um, what, the coolest flight, one of the coolest flights I've ever had in my life. Uh, so that one is very memorable. Uh, I, I, was, I was like, that should be illegal. Like you can actually fly up 1,000 feet. You're not talking to anybody um, right up the Hudson River, really cool. Um, the other one is a four ship flight of helicopters. So I was flying H 60s for the Navy. It's like the Navy version of Black Hawk. And we were flying to Nellis Air Force Base in Las Vegas from San Diego, a station in San Diego. And I was the lead aircraft. So there's four of these Black Hawks. We had like M240 machine guns sticking out of the windows and stuff like that. And we're flying up the strip 
So I asked for clearance to go up the Las Vegas Strip and the controller said, um, you're clear at 500 feet and below. So he's like under 500 feet. We couldn't go over 500 feet. So we were up 200 feet. I took these guys down at 200 feet. We're flying up the, the Las Vegas Strip, four Blackhawks, um, way under all of the other um, towers, things like that, but you know, the, the hotels and everything like that. People probably like, what's going on? There's martial law about to happen. It was so fun. Um, so those are two like really fun ones. And then I have had one where I was, I was in England at test pilot school, flying a gazelle. It's a three bladed, um, French helicopter. It's a really small helicopter and we're doing a, a ceiling climb. So we're climbing up to see how high we could take this thing before it would stop climbing. And, uh, it's what you do when you test a brand new aircraft. We have oxygen masks on, we have parachutes in case anything goes wrong. And, um, something did go wrong. I could not control the helicopter. We got up to about. 17,500 feet. It was negative 50 degrees Celsius up there. And uh, something just went wrong. Like I didn't have control of the stick really. I have massive movements in the controls and it wasn't moving the aircraft that much. Um, I was doing a test point and there's a flight test engineer next to me from Australia. He probably had eight flight hours at that point, like brand new to flying. We had just shown up to the school, you know, a few months before. And he keeps telling me to do stuff and I said, I just said, hey, you're gonna need to sit there and be quiet. Do you know how to use that parachute? Like I was dead serious, yelling at him, very loud. Um, and he looked at me like, oh crap, I'm just gonna stop talking. And the whole rest of the time, I, I was able to get us down and land us safely. Um, but it was a scary time. I thought we were actually gonna have to use the parachute and ditch the helicopter. Um, I was able to fly it back to the base and, and land it. So uh, it turned out there was some, some problems with the, with the hydraulic oil and they had to drain every single helicopter of hydraulic oil in the entire British Navy fleet. So it was pretty, pretty wild after that. So there's a couple of stories for you. I, I've heard, though, just to put a cap on it, is that it's actually safer to I think it was safer to fly than to drive. Right. Oh, more. Yeah. More, I mean, cool. I, I don't so know. I'm just if making sure everyone knows that right after. Yeah. If you look at those statistics, like uh, I've only crashed one helicopter uh, and I wasn't flying it. Somebody else was flying it. Um, but it, I don't know if you look, look at those statistics, what do you mean crashed so it? Like driving. you guys ditched, you guys ditched it and jumped out no, or you guys we, like crashed. So, I mean, we could tell these stories all day. I can't. So we were, <laughs> uh, we were doing, I was at test pilot school again in England in another gazelle, um, same helicopter and we were doing engine off landing. So we actually like pull the engine back and turn it off and then uh, try to land it with, without an engine. And we're doing a bunch of different test points and I was the engineer. They didn't have an engineer. So I told my friend, I said, I'll go fly with you. I just went out. He was an Australian pilot. The Aussies seem to be the, um, the people you don't want to fly with. So uh, because it always goes wrong. So I was taking notes and running the test points. And uh, he mean, he just came down way too low and smashed the tail into the ground, like just smashed the entire helicopter tail into the ground. Fortunately for me and him, he, he flew it very well to a landing. So he could have really like he could have killed us for sure. He could have rolled it over. He could have freaked out. Um, but he stayed cool, stayed calm. He leveled it, leveled out the skids and we just kind of slid on. And it's a much longer story and much funnier if I, if I told the whole thing, but he kind of looked at me and earlier on in the flight, I said, I said, Hey, like, that's pretty low, man. I think you're going to hit the tail. He goes, no, no, that's just how I do my landings. And, um, so after the second one, I look at him and he goes, I, I didn't hit the tail. I went, okay. And we kept flying. And then when he did this, when he smashed it tail into the ground, he looked at me and he goes, that was the tail. <laughs> <laughs> and I got out, the whole tail was all smashed up. I said, dude, you got to shut it down. We called the base and they, they bring out the, the minivan to pick us up and, uh, and took us inside in the U S they would take our logbook, They would stop the flight. They would make us like pee in a cup. They check us for drugs. They check our, our how much we ate, what, how much we slept, all that stuff in England. I got yelled at because I was late for my next flight. They said after that, they were like, you're late. They start screaming at me. You got a check ride. I started to go in another aircraft. I had to fly a check ride um, right after that. My buddy said he he like said I'm not flying his second flight for the day. He was pretty shook up, but I was fine. So, dude, that's wild. I I love these stories, especially because I'm not a pilot. So the people that fly or have flown or have people, they they know they know what's up. And then obviously you have a lot of hours. And like I said, even if people are like, man, I don't want to fly now. It's better to fly than drive. Maybe there's a lot of dumb drivers as well. There's a lot, anyone can pretty much get a license. So maybe that was oh, why it kind of makes sense I'd rather, as well. But I'd rather be in the air than on the road for sure. Wow. Legit. And uh, for you, I think one cool thing that you've done is you transitioned 
not even transition, but just like gone into business really well. I talked to a guy just the other day and he was about 39, a firefighter. He was, I think, Navy firefighter, 39 started a business. And this was like a few years ago. And he's like the king of Airbnb arbitrage in Mexico now. And I'm mm. just like, bro, like that is a solid transfer. I know that you guys have been in the real estate game. You got your eight figure entrepreneur sweatshirt on for people that are watching video. Some of the credentials of the people that you guys have worked with and some of the things kind of keep, take people up to speed on, on what you guys are doing in real estate, but also how did you do that really well? Like military is, is a phenomenal career, but it is a career and you know, the military is not going to prepare you to build a business. Like it's just, or else everyone would come out and become a successful business owner. And yeah. so for you, tell tell people where you guys are at, what you guys are doing, and then take me to how did you guys get into that and successfully do it? Cause I know that's a lot of people's dream. Yeah. So, um, so I was a pilot for the, for the Navy, obviously I flew uh, helicopters and airplanes for 15 years of active duty and I'm about to retire in May actually right now. So I did five, I'm still working for the reserves. So once a month I go to Atlanta right now and I work for the reserves. Um, I was able to fly in the reserves for four years. And then this last year, I'm kind of flying a desk in Atlanta kind of stinks, but I'm just waiting for my 20 years. I'm almost done. So um, while I was active duty, I got, uh, we got engaged to my wife. We ended up, we got married and we had our first, she got pregnant pretty early on a few months later. And uh, I just, I knew I needed like to make more money. So I think for you guys, like I went from feeding one mouth to feed and taking care of myself to three very quickly. And I just, I wanted, I didn't want to keep deploying all the time. I wasn't sure the military was going to be the place for me. Um, and so I was, I was still active duty. I was a test pilot in Patuxent River, Maryland. Met my wife in England when I was in, uh, in te at test pilot school in England. And um, I started, I dabbled in real estate a little bit before that, had like one rental property. And I started buying a couple rental properties and then I flipped my first house. And so I made, I ended up making $43,000 on that first house. And that was like half of my salary in the Navy. And so I was like, wow, could I do this again? It took me six months to do it again. So I took me six months to find another house. And we had moved to Pensacola, Florida at that point, left Maryland, moved to Florida. And I flipped another one, made 45,000. And I said, wow, this is repeatable, um, but I don't know that it's scalable. I, I couldn't figure that out. I was doing one house a year. Um, then I paid $25,000, joined a mastermind group. That's a much longer story. I was incredibly cheap. Wouldn't even, wouldn't even buy a book. I had a library card and I would wait like, Sometimes I'd wait like three weeks or a month to get my the book that I needed. I'd have a problem wow. and I wouldn't even buy the book. I was so cheap. And uh, I really was like cutting expenses. I, I was just very frugal person yep. for a very long time. Um, and when I saw that $25,000 mastermind, I was like, that is an Acura or a Honda. Like I actually looked at it like a liability, like a car. Like what could I spend yep. this money on instead of invest this money in myself? I had a totally different mindset at the time. Wow. But I did it because everybody else, like I also like to win. I'm very competitive. And these people were talking about making a million dollars a year and there was a contest. So I was like, if there's a contest, I want to be involved. And, um, and so I joined this mastermind. I ended up flipping and wholesaling 67 houses that first year. We did almost 700,000 the first year in about eight months. And then I did 135 houses the year after that. I did 187 the house, yeah, houses the year after that. And I was still active duty during this time. So I was still making my money. I was flying 10 or 12 hours a day, every day. I was working one weekend a month. I'd have to go fly somewhere with my students and uh, was able to scale this business up with the things that I was being taught in that mastermind group. Um, so I was able to scale a real estate business. I ended up having about 15 people working for me. We we're doing about 3 million you know, gross profit, top, top line gross profit, not gross revenue. Gross revenue is like realtors saying they're doing, you know, a billion dollars in sales of prices of houses we were doing you know yeah, yeah. probably i don't know probably 50 to 100 million dollars of of revenue but then gross profit we we'd have about three million and i was making i don't know anywhere from my my best year i probably made like six or seven hundred thousand net something like that as as we scaled i made a little bit less money but i wasn't working anymore i was doing like two hours a week in that business i had a coo mm -hmm. running the company i was able to scale it up and make it more passive income and then I went and started working for the coaching company that I joined the mastermind from. So I paid, joined the mastermind, became a coach. Then I became the COO of it. And uh, about three and a half years ago, I bought it from my mentor. So I bought this company called Seven Figure Flipping. I actually bought it from him. And then I changed it around, scaled it, redesigned everything, rebranded it, and started scaling that up. And we did about seven and a half million in that company last year. 
Um, and I got to the point where I'm making a couple million dollars a year now with all the, I have five different com real estate companies. We have the coaching company and uh, all like mastermind based. All the coaching companies are mastermind based. So that's kind of the last maybe six, maybe eight years of my life. So perfect and, and perfectly to unpack it as well. Scripture talks about that. This is, I think, when Nicodemus was talking to Jesus or something, and he said said something around the lines of like, like the the wind comes and blows, and you don't know where it comes from, where it goes, and you can't freaking see it, but yet it's moving things that you can see, the trees, mm -hmm. and like you can feel it. It's weird, right? And it's kind of like this concept of of spiritual things in general. For you, I like looking at the overlap of that, right? You have like the physical things that you guys have done, military. Uh, relationship, by the way, like the chance of getting divorced, being a military marriage is like far higher than anyone else. You have uh, family, you have building a business, the mindset, how much did faith play a part in that? Can you kind of tell me your faith? You, I told you told your business origin. Can you give me your faith origin on how that came about? Because I'd love to see that peeled layer that no one really gets to see in business world. They look at that and they go, oh, I'm going to go do what he did. And not knowing that maybe there was a faith element to that as well, where you were getting some, maybe some wisdom, divine insight, uh, just a higher standard of living. Maybe you weren't, I'm, I may be assuming as well, but tell me what that faith story was like. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to go back to your military conversation about divorce. So just, we also have a special needs child. We have our middle son was born and he's going to come to the story in a second. His name's James. Wow. He's had five open heart surgeries. Four of them were in the first six months of his life. He has a chromosome anomaly. He's a mosaic ring 13 chromosome. So um, he didn't eat for the first three and a half years of his life. He had a G tube. It was, a, it was really hard on my wife and myself. And wow. Um, wow. so like that combined with the military, it has been a big challenge and, and add COVID on top of that and all this other stuff. Like my wife actually did go through a huge um, depression, anxiety, um, ended up you know, three months she was at a facility trying to work on this. Um, wow. I talk about it a lot, so it's not a total secret. Uh, but she asked me for a divorce in that time, and we hit like the lowest of the low, and we're able to kind of battle back and like re fall in love and re uh, re engage with each other and everything. And and uh, it's just an incredible story for me to keep persevering through the time where you're like at the lowest of the low. So we can get to there if we want, but I know people out there like that's really important to me and. Um, and faith at that moment played a massive part of it. But I grew up, my dad grew up in a very strict Catholic household. So my grandmother and grandfather, like my grandmother specifically was like, like the perfect Catholic woman. And they were altar boys and like you, you name it. They were also grew up in the, in the sixties and seventies and they were hippies. So they were like battling back this back and forth with faith and I think my dad really kind of, my dad was the oldest, so he had to take care of all the other kids. He's got, there's six of them. And he's, he's like 18 years older than his youngest uh, sister. So like huge difference. Like he was in college when she was born about, you know, it's, it's huge range. And um, so he was the most responsible one and he's first born, I'm first born. So we have a lot in common there. Uh, but when I was a kid, he kind of like rebelled from the Catholic faith and he, he, we, we didn't really go to church a ton until I was getting older. And then we went to a Unitarian Universalist church. So I, went, I actually grew up at getting confirmed basically at a Unitarian church, which is basically they teach all of these different faiths there. So I would learn about all kinds of different stuff. And then I went into the military and I kind of got lost. Like I just got lost. Um, I was drinking a lot. I, was, I wasn't the best guy uh, flying all the time. Um, and uh, I was just kind of like trying to, figure it out. And eventually I came back to the Catholic church and I was like, I really need to go back to church. I had this, uh, my aunt's best friend in San Diego. She was like my mom in, on the West coast. And so she would have me over for, I'd go to church with them on Sunday and I'd go to lunch and dinner with them and just hang out their house. Um, cause it was a totally different life than what I was living. I was living a single bachelor life, flying helicopters and airplanes in San Diego, in Pacific beach, drinking all the time. Um, just, it wasn't good. Like, uh, frankly, I thought I was having fun and I was fulfilled, but I wasn't. And so um, I have a lot of alcoholics and alcoholism in my family. And uh, I was definitely like going that direction and pretty much there. And so, um, but I thought I was, I thought that's what you're supposed to do, especially in the military. This is kind of like what goes on and it's not right, but it's pretty common. And so um, fortunately I didn't kill myself. I didn't screw anything up. I didn't get DUIs. I didn't, nothing, none of that stuff happened. 
but I, um, when, when I, when I went, I, so I was kind of going to church off and on the Catholic church. And I just never felt like I was going cause I wanted to go. I felt like I was going to act cause I had to go. And uh, it was more like guilt taking you there, which I think a lot of Catholics would, would understand. Um, and then I, so I got married in the Catholic church when my, I went to England and met my wife at that time. I, um, we got married when we came back to, um, to Maryland, uh, got married in Catholic church and still was just only like, just kind of like dabbling. And I never really could find where I fit. And so my story goes, it's about six and a half years ago. Um, my, we found out my middle son, my second son, James, we were pregnant with him about halfway through 20, 22 weeks. And we found out he had a heart defect. He only had half a heart, no right half, right side of his heart. I was running my business at the time. I was doing, doing pretty well. Um, when I got married and had my first son, I, I stopped drinking. I, I just was like, I'm not, I'm not going to drink wow. this. I, I, I was building my business. I was like, I, I need to focus on this. Can't, I can't be hung over. I can't show up that way. My dad did this when I was a kid, when, when I was young, my dad, um, my dad never have alcohol in the house. And so, um, his brothers like, oh man, they would drink like crazy. My dad never drank around us at all and just stopped and quit. And so I was like, I'm following that lead. This is going to be my life. I'm going down the drain here. Um, and I want to be better. And so that was like kind of a start of it. There was something going on there with family, with marriage, with me getting serious and kind of growing up. I was like 30 six years old, by the way, it wasn't like I was in my twenties. And so, um, so I, I wasn't, wasn't drinking and I was focusing on my business. That was where my focus was on my fo business and my family. And, um, so I was, had a successful business. We we're probably doing a million, million and a half, but we found out about James and I feel like God put James in my life to slow me down, refocus me on, on, it's not about me. Like, um, it, and I think, I think like hope, is a who like hope and faith. There's like a who, like some, someone gets put in our life for a very specific reason. So James was the first one we found before he was born, before he's born, we went up to Nashville because he couldn't have surgery in Pensacola, Florida. He had, um, they didn't have a pediatric cardiothoracic surgeon in Pensacola. So they're saying you could have the baby here, but you're going to have to find a hospital to go have the surgery. And so we went to Nashville. I, uh, I, t I remember meeting with the, with the head surgeon for the kids at children, the children's hospital in Vanderbilt and, uh, Dr. Bichelle is his name. And he's, I, we had this meeting. He's talking about how great the hospital is. They show us around all this stuff. And I, I sat there and I said, Hey doc, if, um, if this was your son and you could have him in Pensacola and live there and have this surgery, or you had the option to just move to move to Nashville, to have the surgery here, which one would you do? And he goes, well, if I had the option and it was the same, then I would move here for sure. And so in that moment, I, we went, um, we went back home and we, I bought a house on the internet in seven days. I had a truck packed up and we moved, we were moving to Nashville. Um, but while I was in Nashville at that visit, my aunt lived there, my dad's youngest sister and her, she was, she was, divorced maybe five, six years before and her son and her daughter live with her. And so that was part of the reason she was in, she's in nursing, she's in the hospital, she's in that world. So Nashville was a, an option. She said, come up here, stay with me and check out this hospital. While I was there, her 15 year old son said, come to church with me. He couldn't even drive there. I had to drive him there, but he said, come to this church. And he it's a Christian church. It's a, like a non-denominational Christian, Christian church. They're playing music, this kind of stuff. Right. And so I'm like, I am not going to that church. There's no way like, there was one of those in San Diego. I heard about it. Everybody's raving about it. Like I'm not that, that place is not where I go. I go to this Catholic church over here where it's just, no, I'm not going there. And so he said, just come. He's like, it's great. You're going to love it. I love it. And he kept just insisting that I go. And I was like, all right, I'll go. And so I drive him there and right outside, there's some guy out in the parking lot waving yeah. on the way in. And I'm like, here we go, man. Here we go. <laughs> it's me, him and his sister. We all go together. And uh, they start playing music during worship and his, her sister's hands are in the air and she's going wild. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like, I, I don't know about this place, right? Yep. And then the pastor comes up and he starts preaching. 
and I feel like I'm the only person in the room. There's probably a thousand people in there, maybe maybe 600. I feel like I'm the only person in there who's talking directly to me. Wow. And I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer. I'm always, have always questioned things. I'm always like, I don't know, do I believe this or do I not believe this? And so uh, like, show me the data, show me the math of how this works. You know, that's what I would always say. And uh, so six and a half years ago, I'm there. And at the end I was like, wow, like, oh my gosh, like this was, this was like life changing. And um, I went home and I was like, this is not possible. Like this is, there's something going on. There's some, something that's involved here. And we went back to Pensacola, went back to Pensacola, decided to move here. I, I talked to my commanding officer. I was still active duty. I said, I'm moving. We, we bought that. I, I made an offer on the house, got it under contract, you know, pay cash, move fast, everything that we do in my business. Fortunately, I, God put me in a place that I had the business. I had the money. I had the ability. I had the knowledge. And I didn't realize it at the time, but he was preparing me to, for, for exactly what I needed to do to move my family, to take care of my son. And, um, we moved and, and, but while we were there, I said, I'm going to show up next Sunday. It's on, it's on, uh, YouTube. They stream on YouTube. I'm going to show up next Sunday and I'm going to prove that this was a fluke that, that the next Sunday, there's no way that it's going to be like that pastor's talking to me. That was a fluke. I was in the room. I was feeling this way. It's probably all this stuff with my son. So I went, I was on YouTube in Pensacola. I said, Lucy, you watch Will. I'm going to watch this church thing. She wasn't really into it then. And I watched it and I was like, it's a different pastor, different pastor. First one was a guy named CZ. This one is a guy named Darren. And he, it's like, I'm, I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, like what's happening? He's talking directly to me again. And I was, I was like, okay, all right. All right. I give up. I'm, I'm in, I'm all in. And since then I have never missed a service at that church. And we've been here for six and a half years. Um, if I'm not there on Sunday, I try to be there on Sunday in person, but if I'm traveling or some other thing we're doing, we're on vacation, I'm watching it on, on YouTube and I haven't missed a, a service. And I am, uh, I, I, I got saved, like fully saved six and a half years ago at that church by a 15 year old kid who could not drive me there, who was yeah, way, like was way like wiser than me. Wow. It just shows you how seemingly insignificant God God can use certain things, but also just in general, you think you have to be this. Think about how many people in your business. I need to flip lots of homes. I need to do this to be qualified. And it's like, well, yeah, you would have thought that maybe a successful business guy would have invited you to church and you would have respected him. But God used a 15 year old boy that couldn't drive himself to church. Like I lost weight from some idiot who was eating a, a fruit. And I was like, why are you eating that? And he told me why. And something clicked, man. I, I like, Left there, boom, lost 60 pounds. Never even asked anyone else for help. Just what that guy told me. Seemingly insignificant, impactful, but also living it. I think that's a really big piece of it is that they're not just talking it. They're actually living it. This guy that was eating fruit, he was living it. Though he's a 15-year-old kid, he had conviction. He was living it. And and obviously, there was something at work there. So to walk me through that, that process. You go through that. What did that what did that look like even for your wife? You had this experience, but the, I don't know if you know this, but if a man, this is why I love King's Brotherhood, what we're doing with the guys. If a man makes a decision, and again, most women already want to have holistic lives. They already want to have balance in the home. They already want to be healthy. Guys are a lot of the problem. But if a guy makes a decision, there's a 91% chance that the whole family makes the same decision. So for mm -hmm. faith, 91% chance that family gets saved. Everyone follows Jesus if the man does. 19% chance if the wife is the one who initiates it first, because the man on average will not follow what, the, what she says, but the opposite mm. will happen. The kids make the decision. There's like an 8% chance, single digit. So the kid makes a decision. Doesn't mean that that's what the whole family is going to do, but 91% chance if you make the decision, which is crazy. And think about how that is for business, personal development, health, and when you look at the average household, you're like, yeah, women a lot of times want to be healthy. And the guy's like, I don't eat that crap. You know, it's like, dude, come on. So for you, what was that like when you had that encounter? How was, how did that go with the family? How did they take it? And what was their walk like? Yeah. So my, so my wife grew up in England. So I'll give you some background because I think context is really important. 
So grew up in England. If you know anything about the British uh, people, it's, it's a little bit different culture, community, all that stuff. So did, grew up in a small village. They have about maybe 20,000 people in the village and no faith in our family at all. Like nobody's going to church. It's, it's just not a thing that happens in the majority of like the, the church of England split off from Catholicism a long time. You go back in history and go through all that stuff, but it's just not, um, not something that she was ever brought up in. Right. And so for us to get married in the Catholic church, there was a lot that had to happen for me to do that. So that conversation kind of started there. Um, but she didn't see me as a, a church goer. Uh, I, I, I honestly, I didn't have a lot of faith that like, yeah. I just, I was just going. It was like I, a religion. Like you're a yeah. part of like a culture. That's why you didn't like the, the Christian church is because you were like, this goes against my culture of yep. religion. Like we don't sing like that. We don't play. This isn't the way it's supposed to go externally. This is how, this isn't how you yep. do church. So you're kind of more in that kind of phase at the time. Oh, I actually use the word like cult. Like I'm not going to that place. They're going to be like holding <laughs> their hands up and singing and doing all this stuff like loud music. Oh, wow. and then the guy yeah, waving yeah. at the front door. I was like, here we go. Man. <laughs> yeah. And yeah so you're then, like, and then welcome when I into the fire. Yeah. When I look back, I'm like, okay, well, wait a second. I was just like sitting, kneeling, standing and repeating things that I would have to study and learn and just do it over and over and over again. Cause somebody's telling me to, I was like, that actually seems more like what I was afraid of than the others. <laughs> so, um, I don't want to like really piss anybody off that's listening, but, um, that, yeah, that's you me. Can do whatever I, you want, man. That's the, that's part of the men's men's <laughs> stuff is like, yeah, it's crazy. I go into a co-ed environment, bro. And I'm like, gosh, I have to really watch myself. I'm with all the guys and I'm like, man, I can say whatever I want, you know, but I, yeah. I, well, I totally I, get you. To yeah. I would it. tell you, like, I was like, well, you know, I'm, I really, I really start challenging other people now to say like, Hey, what one actually does look like the cult? Um, because, and, and that was a perspective shift for me. It's just like everything that I've known. And, um, so, so my wife not having a background, she would, she wouldn't go with me or anything like that. And in, in the beginning, when, when we moved to Nashville, um, it was just me, it was me and my wife and our one son, Will, he was, he was little, he was like two years old. And James, when you mentioned like God puts like, get, not only did God put a 15 year old in my life, but he put this baby in my life, like this baby with problems, with needs, with, um, wow. with issues, with all these things to actually give me some serious perspective because I was so selfish. I was so selfish before this that I had to become massively selfless to be wow. able to serve him, to serve my spouse, to serve the community, to serve my company, to serve all these things. So as I look back, like I can just track all of this stuff to say like all of these dominoes are lining up to prepare me for something bigger and, um, and to open my eyes and to kind of wake me up, right? And so the 15 year old is like James first, then the 15 year old, then lots of other people, then CZ, then Darren, CZ prayed over us nonstop while Lucy was pregnant. Then afterwards, we got to know each other really, really well. Then Darren came in, then other pastors, all these things up now, small group, uh, church group, Bible study groups for me, uh, other entrepreneurs in my local area that are doing Bible studies together. It just all lines up. So Lucy, comes into the story as starting to go to church with me after James was born. So mm -hmm. while, while she was pregnant and in the hospital, she was in the hospital with James. So we had James about three weeks after we got here. And what happened was he needed an emergency surgery over Thanksgiving. He was born on October 21st. They didn't think he would need surgery for three months. If we we're in Pensacola, we'd be in an air, we've been in an air ambulance flying somewhere. But since we moved here, and the tug was very strong, right? Moved here. Part of it was that church. Part of it was all the things that were unfolding. And because of that, we were here to have his surgery with the doctor that we knew in the location that we knew down the street from our house with my aunt and my cousin who's married to a doctor who's at Vanderbilt who could actually look up his chart for us and tell us things. So all of this wow. stuff started happening. And so then Lucy was in the hospital for six weeks with James. When he came back, we, we brought him to church. I wanted to bring him there for CZ to pray over him right there with him. And, and she came and she started coming every week. We would go every week. We would go together, our family. They have, uh, so James would come in with us. They have a kid's ministry for, for Will. He'd go to the daycare there. Um, the little, um, kid city, they call it. And so, uh, she came and then about, it's probably about a year later, 
she ended up getting baptized at this church. Wow. So she's get, got baptized at Church of the City a year later. Um, now, it's not a perfect story because when she was going through all of her anxiety, all of the depression, all of that stuff, um, she, she went to a facility here in Nashville locally. And in that facility, there were a bunch of other people there. It was all women. It was drug addicts. It was people who were trying to kill themselves. It was all this stuff. And it was a it was a really nice facility, right? I, I I wanted the best place. I wanted all that stuff, and all of that started to rub off on her. All of that like like uh, supernatural stuff. Like I care more about the land and the dirt than I do about God. And so, do yeah, I yeah. even believe it? So she she then massively distanced, asked me for a divorce. All this stuff happened. Our entire wow. world blew up. And since then, since then, she has not been back to church with me since then. So wow. it's not a perfect story. It was a perfect story up until that, right? But yeah. here's, where, here's where I'm at. Here's where I'm at with it all. Is there's no, I don't force this, but every single yeah. Sunday, what I do is I take, I take our kids and we go to church. And every single Sunday, I invite her to come with me. And I just open the door and I open the door and I open the door. And honestly, like last, last Sunday, I could see it. She, I was like, hey, you know, you're always invited to come with us if you want to come. Because I, 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 earlier, I was like forcing it. I, I was like, hey, you got to come. I make her feel guilty for not coming, all these things. And now I just open the door. I'm like, you know what? When I was ready, he showed up. When she's ready, he's going to show up. I'm, I'm going I'm to open the door. I'm going to open the door. I'm going to open the door. And so I take the kids. We go, I bring three kids to church with me, four, six, and eight, one special needs. And then I take them to the park. I take them to lunch. We have an entire day of it. Um, and I don't care if my kids don't want to go. My kids go. They, you are yeah. going. And so you don't get a choice. You're eight. My eight-year-old is probably the worst. He wants to play on the iPad. But honestly, when he goes there and he gets there and afterwards, I'm like, hey, buddy, are you glad we went? He goes, yeah, I'm so glad I got to go. And, oh, man, it's so cool to hear my four-year-old say Jesus in the car on the way home. He's like, Dad, There's today a... we learned about Jesus. And I'm like, this is awesome. <laughs> I, I just had interviewed a guy. I think he didn't believe in God. Uh, but his, he, man, there was one point there where his kid was about three years old. And when he had finally decided, hey, I'm going to follow God, they had the people come pray over his house and everything. And his son always coughed at night and like coughed every night. It would keep him up. That night he never coughed. But when his son went to bed that night, he said, dad, there's no sun. And he's like three. So he's like, what are you saying? Like, bud, do you normally see something in your room before you go to bed? And his three-year-old was like, yeah, now it's gone. And the kid never coughed after that. And it was the craziest thing of like, it was just a wild story. But I just looked up this verse, Philippians 1, 6. And it's a great thing, just like even declaring truth over, over your guys' situation. Is it, if for some reason, what came to me was the I'm convinced and confident of this very thing, which this is amplified because I Googled, but uh, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue to perfect it and complete it and complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. And so I was like, just whoever start, if he started a good work, like he's going to complete it. And, oh, yeah. and it looks, you're doing a great job stewarding it. But I was just like, I was like finding just what's the thing that I can lean on. You know, it's like, what's, where's the promise at? What does he say about this? And, and uh, I appreciate you actually you sharing that with us as well. I think it's amazing. And how, how's James now? How's he doing? James is awesome. He's had his uh, he had his fifth surgery about a year ago. Wow. Um, and he's a make a wish kid. So we've been waiting for his wish trip. So um, but he's uh, during COVID, we had one planned. And then it, during COVID, like Disney shut down and everything shut down and they said no. Yeah. trip. So um, in March, March for spring break, we're taking him to Disney, just me, my wife, Lucy and, and James on his make a wish trip. So he gets like a limo to go in the airplane to uh -huh. fly down to Disney to get like VIP everything. I, I'm just so excited for him. He's in kindergarten now. Um, he has a one on one person at kindergarten. You know, he's, he's I would put him on the on this on the app. Like I would compare him to an autistic kid that's about four years old. So he's six, maybe six and a half. And so he's him and our four year old are the exact same height, same size. You would think they were twins if you saw him. Everybody says, "How old are they?" Um, and uh, but he's 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 amazing. Like honestly, he just 
He's so beautiful, so loving. He never cries. He's always smiling. He could fall down and hit his head and he just gets back up like what happened. Um, it's just re- such a cool kid. And I really take the um, take the mindset of like, he, he's here for me. You know, like this didn't happen to me, it happened for me. And uh, and I really believe that. I mean, our life is definitely more challenging than, than people that have three kids. Um, and it's it's not easy, but like it's so fun, especially when you get him by himself. Like he's such a special little boy that everybody loves him at school. All the kids, the older kids, are like hugging him and hanging out with him. He's just so sweet and pure. Like he's totally pure. Um, it's really cool to see. So I mean, he's he's magical. I hope everybody out there gets a chance to meet him and see him and, and spend time with him because he really is. Yeah. Cool. What do you think is the the core thing that's helped you build the business through all this? I think it's it's one thing to now look at even a man and I when we were dating before we even just had a kid. And it's one thing to just work your tail off when everything's going good. But in this place of opposition, time being sucked away, your military, I mean, you're about to just leave the reserves and you got this like track record of seven plus figure revenue for like, you know, of, of net revenue for like a long time. You know, it's like you ha- you've, you've had a lot of time in the military you have this whole family situation. You had your wife's thing. I, I relate to it with my wife went through a thing where it's after we ran an event, her family went to the hospital for COVID. They were in the hospital. My son got really sick. I was running an event and my wife stayed up for like three days straight. My son wouldn't sleep unless she was holding him. After that, for months, I don't know how long it was. She slept like 10 hours a week. She couldn't sleep 10 hours a week. We're talking like one, one and a half hours a night. And she'd be laying in bed and couldn't go to sleep. She'd wake up and like, you know, it was just crazy. You go, you start, anyone would start going crazy at that point. If you're not sleeping, it's like wild. And I'm like trying to run a business, trying to take care of my son. And like, that's just with one kid. You know, I have another guy, JJ, phenomenal guy. He had two kids. He's one of the the, the lowest statistic, two different women. Uh, his first wife actually tragically died and he got remarried, two different uh, moms, kids both got leukemia and it wasn't because of his genetics or anything and like him walking through that and he's built this phenomenal business with multiple locations from nothing and came from he was at one point he was a police officer and, and now he's got these locations and all this stuff and he's walking through this like dark heaviness of just like reports and negative things and and i'm just like bro how the heck did you do that so for you how did you layer and, and still succeed in the in the career and the business side in the myths of all this stuff going on? Yeah. Uh, so as, as much as I'd like to say it was it was me, I've seen people in, in being a coach and a mentor in this business for a long time that shouldn't have been successful that are and people that should be successful that aren't. And I'm I'm a scientist like I really like. My background is in engineering. I have mechanical engineering undergrad, aeronautical engineering master's degree. The test pilot was all math and science and engineering stuff. And I can't make sense of it. So um, I, I truly think there's one word. I feel like there's one word for me and it's in my core values. I have five core values. And the one word that I always come back to is stewardship. So so mine is is extreme ownership. Like I take ownership. I take responsibility for everything in my world. Everything's my fault. Stewardship, hard work, integrity, and personal and professional development. These are my five core values, everything that I do. And for me, I just feel like if if I'm a good steward of what I have and what I'm given, then I'll get more. And if I'm a good steward of that, then I'll get more. And this is a, an entire biblical principle of yeah. really just like, of if you can actually like take care of what you've been blessed with, then more will come. And so I'm always thinking like right now, like, okay, I have this amazing thing going on. I have this amazing business. I have an amazing family. I have an, this money that's coming in. How can I be the best steward of this? And, and where are you directing me next? Mm-hmm. And whenever that tug comes, I just like follow it, try to follow it. And um, most of pe- most people out there think it's them, but it's not them. Like these ideas, these goals, these things that come to you, these things that pop into your mind. It's like 
that is not you, like you, you, you we're the vessel, right? So if, if I can, if I can be a good steward of that, okay, one year ago, maybe one and a half years ago now, I was sitting in church and there was this, this sermon. I love our, I love our church so much because they actually teach. So they teach what it was like at the time that the Bible was written, what was going on, what was happening in the world at that time, what was happening with the people, who are they, what's their background, what's their story and message and teach that. And I am still like a baby Christian. Like I, you mentioned like, we learned so much about business. What I wrote down is like, how I spend so much time and money investing in my business and my mindset and my strategy. Am I spending enough time and money and energy and effort investing in my faith? in my the Christian side of my life, because it's skewed. It's not, it's not one-to-one -one right now. And yeah. It should be. And so like, um, anyway, I, a year and a half ago, I'm sitting there and they're, they're teaching me this story and they're talking about like tightrope walker. And they're telling the story about the, a tightrope walker and walk on the tightrope. And, and what hits me in this entire message is like, you have to have like massive faith to walk into anything that's this uncertain thing that you're doing. And all I heard was you have a platform, people follow you, what are you doing with it? And I was like, oh crap, here we go. I remember getting in my car because I, I didn't share, like I don't have a podcast about faith. I have yeah. a podcast about real estate investing. Yeah, yeah. And and I've always I've been like, who am I to talk about my faith? Who am I gonna offend? Who am I going to yeah um who's gonna walk away from me? Who's not gonna do business with me? Who's gonna get upset because I'm talking about it? I was always worried about what other people think, but all I heard was like, You have this platform, what are you going to do with it? And I was like, mm. drove right to my office, right to my studio, recorded a podcast about this sermon, about this concept, about this tightrope, and letting go of the trapeze. Just like letting go, man, and letting faith take over and and accepting the fact that you are not in control. Like you do not decide what's happening. So I do this podcast about God, about faith, about letting go of the trapeze, about all this stuff. Like, And most downloads, most messages, most feedback, most like biggest response I've ever got. And it just allowed me to keep going into that. So then it was a few months later and I said, well, what if, what if at our huge event in October, called, it's called Flip Hacking Live, what if, if our huge event, we have a worship band come in and play at the wow. end? Like we, cause I, I can see it. I'm like, we do these, this three day conference and then it just ends and everybody leaves. Like, I was like, what if we could just worship on Saturday afternoon together for like an hour. And I could just see like this conference, this business conference that then becomes the worship session. I was like, this would be so awesome. Like somebody might actually get saved in the conference. Like how cool would that be? And I have this platform. I sell thousands of tickets. We have like 1200 tickets we sold. So I'm like, man, I could just introduce somebody to Jesus and that could be part of what we do. And so uh, we got the news boys. If you're listening, you might know who they are. They the newsboys came, uh, they, a couple of them go to my church and they, they just, they just happen to be in Orlando. They happen to be playing a show at Disney world on Friday and playing another show on Sunday in Disney world. And ours was on Saturday. We reached wow. out to them and they were like, I don't know what's happening here, but we actually could come play. And we're already be there. We just have to figure out how to load in, load out. And we we did it. I was freaked out about it. I had no idea what the response was going to be. And we had the newsboys come play a worship concert at the end of our three-day real estate conference. And not one, but three people came up to me afterwards and said, I'm saved. This changed my life. I'm going to church. Since then, one of them has been to church with me, lives in Atlanta, has been to church with me in Nashville twice, was just with me last two Sundays ago here and brought his wife this time. And it was like, so all of that to say, I feel like a lot of us just don't do that. Oh, and by the way, one person that bought my program asked for their money back. 
and I gave it to her. She's like, if you're going to be a religious yeah. organization, I want my money back. But about seven more people bought after that. Yeah. So it's like, it's like, what, what are you, what was I afraid of? And honestly, like, I, I, I don't know. I, we can talk, I could talk for hours on this, but uh, the biggest, biggest thing is like being a good steward of, of what I've been given, what I've been blessed with. And I don't have a big following. I have a very small following. Like you're listening to this, I have like 2,600 people on Instagram. Like, I don't even really know how to use that. I'm just starting to figure it out and, because I went to the course. I went to Kaylin's course. So now I'm like yeah. using everything that they taught me to, to grow that. Right. Yeah. And, and but I know, like, I, I want the good people to get attention. I want the good people to have a following. I want the good people to be good stewards of these things. And I know that I know that we will. And so that for me, that that's the word that I come back to all the time. I feel like the people that are really good stewards of the resources, good stewards of the time, good stewards of of what they've been given, of what they've been blessed with, of their skills and their ability and their their qualities that we've been like, we're all different. We were all given something for a very specific reason to do on earth, right? For yeah. not for our reasons, but like this is our responsibility. So I, that's what I see in most of the people that I see that are successful. Like yeah, there is, I, that's it. I just saw, uh, I was talking to Brandon and we had a guy come over that had been following me and our stuff for a long time come over to a, an event that we did last night. It's like an entrepreneur business Christian group. And we just get them together. We do it for free, just locally to build local community, kind of like a Bible study. Um, and, and it's like, it was so interesting because this guy goes, Brandon, I've been following you since 2017. I always appreciated that you put that you were a Jesus lover in your bio. And he said like, man, I can't believe you actually cared about that. Cause Brandon's operating the business. He's not really, it wasn't the face. But he's kind of kept that in it. And for him, it was always around that scripture, acknowledge me in all my ways, and I will I will make your path straight and crown your efforts with righteousness. And it was like, or crown, crown your efforts with success. And he was like, well, then I should probably at the time, he was like maybe a few years Christian. So he's like, well, I'm going to acknowledge him in all my ways. So he goes, I'm going to acknowledge him on, on social and just put it out there. And it, it impacted this guy so much. And so it's interesting sometimes the give and take of this is why I think it's so important to, to highlight God's business together, right? It's like Jesus and business owners, because people may look at what you do. If someone were to take what Jesus did and just his actions, just the three dimensional actions, they'd be like, man, I want to help people. Let me spit on the ground, rub it into mud and rub it on people's eyes. That's what he did. Let me do that. But what Jesus also did is he followed the voice of his father and he did what he said. He didn't even do that same thing ever again. And for you, people could look at what you do. You went to church that day and, and you then left and you took actions. You created a podcast based on a belief that you had. That's the action. But what works for you and what God's saying to you may not be what someone is God saying mm -hmm. to someone else. On the other side as well is that not knowing, peeling back the layer and looking at, oh, that's how you came to that conclusion also builds this desire, right? It's like they get to see the goodness of God. It says, let your light, and this is for your social media, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father that is in heaven. They're mm -hmm. seeing your good works. They're seeing what God's doing through your life because you're acknowledging him in everything that you're doing in excellence and people are seeing it. So man, I appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming on the God's Business Podcast. I love what you're creating. Uh, I would love for people to get connected to what you're doing. Even just, you're literally interviewing people inside of your planes. Like, like I'm saying planes because I'm sure you're going to have all different types and fleets and all these things. You have your core plane that you're literally interviewing people on. So people have to go check that out. What other things should people get connected uh, to you on? Obviously, Instagram, we have your, it's just your name, Bill Allen, right? On Instagram? Yeah, it's it's Bill Allen REI. And I think that's the same for like REI, like real estate investor. So Bill Allen REI. And I think it's the same for YouTube. So yeah, if you guys, you, you probably have interviewed Brandon. He's, he's, we talked about him a lot here. He was the first person that I interviewed in the airplane. So that one's up. I've interviewed probably three other people that'll be, will be launching the YouTube channel. And I'm really excited about that. Um, I'll absolutely get you in the airplane. We'll just have to figure out when and how, yeah. um, cause I want to keep this conversation going and I want to hear your story. And so I it's really fun. Man. I love just flying the airplane. I'm actually doing some really cool things with it. I've been studying YouTube a ton and I think we can make it even more exciting. So um, when you come on, I'll, you'll probably be the one landing the plane. I'm going to teach you how to land the plane and that's how we'll end it is you landing a plane Let's for the go. first time. So, 
Uh, I tried that on the last two interviews and it was so much fun. Uh, and then we might stall it and just kind of screw around with it a little bit up in the air. So it kind of freaked that, that was the one that I said, don't do that one on me or, or, you know, <laughs> don't make my, don't make me fall asleep. You know, the jet ones where people like, yeah, they, they have so much I, peace, they fall pass out. I can't pull more than like two G's in that plane legally, uh, or it won't have any value when I go to sell it. Um, yeah. but I did just, I did just uh, put a deposit on a helicopter. And so that's coming in a few years. So we'll probably gear that thing up too. And and start making interviews in the helicopter as well when I get it. So uh, that's gonna be a lot of fun.